bombs are gonna die, it's a good So it has a DC suit. AC book TV dancer, Swami Maharaj Shilla Prabhupada. Jail Vishnu bombs are better than I could say. So there's a CC mud book to sit down to Zazida for Prabhupada. Go pray, man, and me. Hare Krishna. Krishna, Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama. Hare Rama. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. 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 Om Namo Bhagavate Bhagavatam, 6th Canto, Chapter 9, The Appearance of the Demon Vritrasura, Text 22. Yes, 22? Mm -hmm. Avishmitam tam paripurna kamam. Avishmitam tam paripurna kamam. Svainaiva la pena samam prasantam. Svainaiva la pena samam prasantam. Vino pasar patyaparam hibalisha. Vino pasar patyaparam hibalisha. Svalangulena tittatarti siddhum. Svalangulena tittatarti siddhum. Avismitam tam paripurna kamam. Avismitam tam paripurna kamam. Svainaiva la bena samam prasantam. Svainaiva la bena samam prasantam. Vino pasar patya param hi balasha. Vino pasar patya param hi balasha. Salangulena. Tittatarti Sindhum Svalangulena Tittatarti Sindhum Avishmitam Tampari Purna Kamam Avishmitam Tampari Purna Kamam Svainaiva La Bena Samam Prashantam Svainaiva La Bena Samam Prashantam Vino Pisar Patya Param Hibalisha Vino Pisar Patya Param Hibalisha Svalangulena Tittatarti Sindhum Svalangulena Tittatarti Sindhum Avishmitam tam paripurna kamam Avishmitam tam paripurna kamam Svenevala bin samam prashantam Svenevala bin samam prashantam Vino parta patya parahi balishaha Vino parta parahi balishaha A 
Avishmitam. Avishmitam. Who is never struck with wonder. Who is never struck with wonder. Dham. Dham. Him. Him. Paripurnakamam. Paripurnakamam. Who is fully satisfied. Who is fully satisfied. Swena. 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 By his own. By his own. Eva. Eva. Indeed. La bena, La bena. Achievements. Achievements. Samam. Samam. Equipoise. Prasantam. Prasantam. Very steady. Very steady. Vina. Vina. Without. Without. Upas. Upasarpati. Upasarpati. Approaches. Approaches. Upadam. Upadam. Another. Another. He. He. Indeed. Indeed. Balisha. Balisha. A fool. A fool. Shra, Shra, of a dog. dog. Langulena, Langulena, by the tail. By the tail. A tittatarti, tittatarti, wants to cross. Wants to cross. Sindung, Sindung, the sea. The sea. Translation: Free from all material conceptions of existence, and never wonderstruck by anything, the Lord is always jubilant and fully satisfied by his own spiritual perfection. He has no material designations, and therefore he is steady and unattached. That Supreme Personality of Godhead is the only shelter of everyone. Anyone desiring to be protected by others is certainly a great fool who desires to cross the sea by holding the tail of a dog. Purport. A dog can swim in the water, but if a dog dives in the ocean and someone wants to cross the ocean by holding the dog's tail, he is certainly fool number one. A dog cannot cross the ocean, nor can a person cross the ocean by catching a dog's tail. Similarly, one who desires to cross the ocean of nations should not seek the shelter of any demigod or anyone else, but the fearless shelter of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Srimad Bhagavatam therefore says, Samashritaye pada pallava plavam mahatpadam punya yashro marare bhavam bhudir vatsa padam 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 yadipadam natesham The Lord's lotus feet are an instructable boat indestructible boat and if one takes shelter of that boat he can easily cross the ocean of nations consequently there are no dangers for a devotee although he lives within this material world which is full of dangers at every step one should seek the shelter of the all-powerful instead of trying to be protected by one's own concocted ideas translation again free from all material conceptions of existence and never wonderstruck by anything the lord is always jubilant and fully satisfied by his own spiritual perfection he has no material designations and therefore he is steady and unattached that supreme personality of god is the only shelter of everyone anyone desiring to be protected by others is certainly a great fool who desires to cross the sea by holding the tail of a dog. Om Yana Chimadandasya, Yana Jana Shalakaya, Chakshur Militam Yena, Tazmai Sri Gurave Namaha, Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nichananda, Sri Advaita Gadadha, Shivasadi Govakta Vrinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. So the colossal cosmic demon Vitrasura has appeared. All because of revenge against Indra. Revenge whether we like it or not, plays a big role in material life. No doubt there has been some time in your life, at least once, when you want to revenge on someone, yes? They did you wrong, they cheated you, 
they did the dirty on you, they lied to you, and the first thing that comes to your mind is to strike back. <laughs> or a milder version, you might think, is not that you personally strike back, but you wish all kinds of ill to fall upon that offender who dared to minimize your glories or who dared to thwart one of your attempts at material enjoyment. So you see revenge happening on the individual level, on the family level, the neighborhood level, the national level, and the international level. In Kali Yuga especially, conditioned souls have a very hard time letting go of grievances. He did this to me. She did that to me. This group of people did this. This group of people did that. This nation did this. This nation did that. This harboring of revenge is a form of sense gratification. When you are possessed by such feelings of wanting revenge, to strike back, to retaliate. There seems to be some kind of fulfillment, some kind of pleasure in that. When I vent my wrath upon you one way or another, I'll feel good. I'll let it out. <laughs> That's Kali Yuga society. Kali Yuga psychology. <clears throat> Whatever you feel inside, vent it, and then you'll feel better. To lock it up inside is very unhealthy. This is what <clears throat> Kali Yuga denizens think of the Bhakti Yoga lifestyle. Oh, you guys and girls must be locking so much inside you. It's very psychologically unhealthy. Just let it out, whatever it is. Lust, anger, whatever. Get it off, get it off your shoulders. Get it off your chest. Things will be better. <laughs> of course, things just become more of a mess. <laughs> but Maya is so inviting. Just let go of your mind and senses. Let them go their natural way. Or follow your intuition. <laughs> or even, as we said the other day, listen to your body. If your body gives a good feeling from something, that means it's morally right. If your body gives a bad feeling, then it's not good for you. Trust your body. So this is Kali Yuga intelligence. And in the activities of the age of darkness and quarrel, revenge plays a very important role. So you can remember in your life, when even though you may not have retaliated, you certainly in your mind retaliated a thousand times. You, I'll fix you, I'll get back at you. Uh, or even you felt powerless, you couldn't strike back. You just in your mind cursed a person. May you have a horrible life. <laughs> when you get yours, I'll be happy. <laughs> you had it coming to you, <laughs> right? <laughs> now shockingly this goes on in the heavenly planets <clears throat> not with the frequency that it happens on the earth planet because you know the earth planet is a middle planetary system mixed happiness and distress whereas the upper planetary system is mostly material happiness with a little bit of distress but as you're reading in Bhagavatam the distresses in the heavenly planets do come, and they can be quite major, but for the most part, uh, life in the heavenly planets is heavenly. But you see, Indra's got himself into a tough spot now, and he's getting reactions. The father of the son that Indra beheaded is now threatening the whole universe with Vitrasura, whose very name means the demon who, whose power and might and size covers huge portions of the universe, not just the earth planet. So 
So a bit trasher is threatening the heavenly planets. This is all about revenge. So what do the devatas do? Because they're devatas, because they're demigods, they turn to the Supreme Personality of Godhead to mitigate their distress. They are Stockholm devotees, mixed devotees. They're certainly devotees. They recognize the existence of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, but they're attached to material happiness and control. That's why they're demigods. So here they are approaching the Supreme Personality Goddess and offering these very, these prayers saturated with awe and reverence. There's nothing about Raga Bhakti in their prayers, a spontaneous attraction for Brajalila. No, this is all awe and reverence, how great thou art. Still, the tattva of what they're saying is very important for one who wants to understand the spontaneous love of Krishna as shown by the residents of Vrindavan. You first need to lay the foundation and appreciate how infinitely great Krishna is. People say God is great, but they have no idea of that greatness. And so you look at their life and what do you see? They say God is great, but meanwhile, we've got some good times. <laughs> we've got some good parties, some good indulgences. They have no idea how the Supreme Personality God it is a supreme enjoyer. And when they hear that, they think, oh, mythology. It's Rasalila lifting Govardhan Hill, pastimes with the cowherd boys on the bank of the Yamuna. But these are all the things they'd love to do. <laughs> Just think. To dash out in the middle of the night into the forest because you've heard the sounds of the flute <laughs> and dance. <laughs> what could be better than that? But because people have no idea of the name, form, qualities, and pastimes of Krishna. They have to take their material enjoyment so seriously. As I often explain, you've heard me explain it at outreach events. For most of your life, until you're old and broken down, for most of your life, your quest is for the awesome. <laughs> That's the Maha Mantra for <laughs> Kali Yuga, awesome. Yeah, that was awesome. <laughs> Last weekend, Saturday night was awesome. Oh, my trip to Thailand was awesome. <laughs> Never mind all the work you had to put in, all the struggle just to get those few magic moments. Doesn't matter. It was awesome. The greatest compliment someone can make about you. Wow, how's so-and-so? Oh, he's awesome. <laughs> That means you made it. <laughs> so without understanding Krishna's name, form, qualities, and pastimes, you're condemned to just try and squeeze temporary pleasure out of the temporary material body and temporary material world. But what the devatas are praying is very significant tattva. Although it's all in awe and reverence, veneration of the power and glory and might of the Supreme Personality of God. But that is the beginning. As the Christian Bible says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's true. But there's a lot beyond that. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, but it's not the end of wisdom. <laughs> but... <coughs> It's good to have at least the beginning that I'm controlled by time. 
my happiness and distress is packed in my body from the start. I'm a puppet in the hands of the material energy, thinking I'm free, autonomous, and individually expressive. So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but it's not the end. The end of wisdom, of course, is spontaneous love of Krishna as shown by the residents of Vrindavan. So the demigods are praying, free from all material conceptions of existence. What does it mean to have a material conception of existence? It means that I, have, I am the body, I am my senses, and I have the pride that with my body and senses, I can acquire material pleasure. I have that kind of pride and confidence. I've got that mission embedded in me. I can do it. So what if it's just for a few moments? I can do it. Everyone else is. And there doesn't seem to be anything better on offer, on tap. So don't blame me. I didn't make this world. <laughs> I'm an innocent bystander, just, you know, just trying to get some satisfaction, help a few others to get some satisfaction. I'm not a miser, I, you know. I, I get high with a little help from my friends. <laughs> I'm charitable, I'm sociable. <laughs> so the material conception of existence means to be trapped in the consciousness that I am the controller and the enjoyer. Remember, in order to enjoy in material life, you have to control to some degree. So next, they say, mm -hmm. Avishmatam, one who is never wonderstruck by anything. Mm -hmm. But on the platform of spontaneous love, this is not true. But from the material point of view, it's true. The Supreme Personality of God is never wonderstruck by anything. But when it comes to the spontaneous love of his devotees, he's wonderstruck so much so that he wants to come as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, as his own devotee, because he's puzzled. What is it my devotees are feeling, experiencing? I can't understand that as, the, as Krishna. I have to come in the role of a devotee. I'm the subject, the one who instigates the loving affairs and applies them to the object. But what's it like to be the object of my love? What does it taste like? What does it feel like? Krishna, so to speak, is perplexed by that. So he comes as his own devotee, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So again, as you heard, sometimes people say, well, if God is perfect and complete, he has to have the possibility of not knowing something. That's true, but then he knows it. <laughs> so, in Brajlila, Krishna is wonderstruck from time to time. Just like when the cowherd boys are marching into the mouth of a gasur. You read in Nectar of Devotion that for a moment Krishna is apparently helpless. Hot tears are pouring from his eyes, Nectar of Devotion says. What am I going to do now? And in Krishna book you read how Krishna is trying to sort the situation out. If I kill the demon with the cowherd boys inside, the cowherd boys could suffer. What do I do? They've marched into his mouth already. So I have to figure out how to extract them, how to save them, and at the same time terminate the demon. But they're inside his mouth. So momentarily, Krishna is puzzled. So you might say, aha, there is a deficiency in the Supreme Person. How do you got it? He's facing a conundrum, something he can't solve, at least for a while. 
But no, this is just Krishna enjoying. He's enjoying being confronted with a puzzle. Of course, everything going on in his leelas, his Braj leelas, it's all arranged by the internal potency, which provides him situations for enjoyment. And so, I can't understand this. What, what to do? That's a for Krishna. That's a pleasure for us. It's anxiety. Oh no! I'm sure you've all been confronted with situations which perplexed you. What do I do now? Oh, if I go right, it's a problem. If I go left, it's a problem. If I stand still, it's a problem. Oh no! This is what Arjuna faced in the very beginning of Bhagavad Gita. He presented to Krishna that every option that I analyze is unfavorable. I don't see how any good can come out of my participating in this battle of Kurukshetra. I only see reverses. I only see the opposite of what of a favorable outcome. So for the ordinary person to, to be perplexed is a liability. You don't want that. You want to understand everything. That's necessary for your sense gratification. And if anyone can help you, give you tips for better sense gratification, for better control and enjoyment of material life, if anyone can do that, you say, oh, that's my friend, that's my well-wisher, thank you. <laughs> You've helped me to have happy days, happy nights. Thank you. That's what friends are for. <laughs> so Krishna's being wonderstruck is just a manifestation of his enjoying his leela, his pastimes. Oh, what am I going to do now? The cowherd boys are in a gossip's mouth. It may be hard for you to understand, but this is Krishna enjoying. Oh, this is a very difficult situation. What to do? You'd be in total anxiety confronted by such. But Krishna is enjoying. I, I, I can't for a moment figure this out. It's pleasure. This is why people play games like chess. Or I don't know if any of you used to play with Rubik's Cube. Anyone? So you, you were relishing in your perverted material way, you were relishing being perplexed. Okay, I got the Rubik's Cube. What do I do? How do I? I forget how it works, but anyway, I never dealt with it. But you, you like, it. or a jigsaw puzzle. <coughs> Kids like to play with puzzles to be momentarily stymied and then figure out the whole puzzle. You see adults, I often see them on the plane or the train and they're, they're doing crossword puzzles. I could never figure out what the Rasa is from <laughs> Anyone here play crossword puzzles? No, no, no. I guess it's the older, you did? <laughs> What's the thrill? Nothing like it. I, I, like, I used to play in my mother's tongue. Like, used to play what? In my mother's tongue, the different words and crosswords. What's the thrill? What's the Rasa? Like, uh, you, you come to know about like different words you don't know. You find it out like you come to know about different meanings of the same words. So you feel like you conquered. <laughs> you, you've made your mark in this world. You've triumphed. <laughs> so we're trying to imitate Krishna in his enjoying being puzzled, wonderstruck. What am I going to do now? And of course, as we said, Krishna's greatest <clears throat> experience of being wonderstruck, perplexed, is trying to understand <clears throat> Srimati Radharani's love. What does she taste in me? What is her position like? What's it like to be in her position? What's the sweetness she tastes in me? What's the happiness she feels in loving me? I can't understand that as Krishna. I have to appear in her position, with her emotions, with her uh, effulgence. I have to do that and then I can understand. So, of course, the 
demigods in their awe and reverence can't reference this intimate Leela of Krishna as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Still, as we discussed the other day, when Mahaprabhu appears, the devatas are so intrigued. They come to earth disguised as human beings to attend kirtans of Mahaprabhu. And the greatest devatas, the greatest demigods, like Lord Shiva, come and meet Mahaprabhu in a solitary place and discuss with him. And as we said the other day, when before Sachi Mata apparently gave birth to Mahaprabhu, the demigods, she saw the demigods all hovering above and waiting for the appearance of Lord Chaitanya. And by Lord Chaitanya's starting the Sankirtan movement of congregational chanting, by his starting that in Navadvip, he set into motion the Sankirtan movement for covering the whole earth. But not only the covering the whole earth, but also covering the universe. So this is the cosmic... Mm, these are the cosmic ramifications of Lord Chaitanya's inaugurating the Sankirtan movement in Navadvip, wandering here and there in Navadvip with a Harinam party. He's setting into motion the Sankirtan movement for covering the whole universe. So what else do the Devatas say? He's always jubilant, fully satisfied by his own spiritual perfection, he has no material designations, and therefore he is steady and unattached. That's something for you to think about. Because we apply material designations to ourselves, we can't be steady in spiritual life, and we're attached to various material experiences, objects, situations, because we think, I am such and such a designation. I have this type of body and therefore I have these kind of needs and these kind of pursuits of happiness because I am such and such a body. But of course Krishna, the Supreme Personality of God, has no material designations. But if you want to know the truth, the Acharya is explaining why there is apparently some little perverted, distorted pleasure in bodily relationships. This is my brother, this is my mother, this is my child. Why is that? Why there's, there seems to be something there, right? <laughs> it's because of Krishna's family affairs in the topmost portion of the spiritual world. Yashoda Nandana. Transcendental designation. I'm the son of Mother Yashoda. Nanda Nandana, the son of Nanda Maharaj. Because of the all spiritual pleasure between the spiritual bodies, the all spiritual bodies in Braj, that pervertedly reflects into the material world. And so there's a little glimmer, a little ray of pleasure in family identification, kinship systems, even mm, nationalism. We're all of the same body. <laughs> There's a little bit of apparent meaningfulness in that, but it's not enough to s anywhere, to come anywhere near satisfying you, and actually it ends in frustration. You've seen it in family affairs. You've seen it in your attempts for romantic relationships. There's something attractive at first about it, isn't it? Well, I'm the body, you're the body. And to put it in Bhagavad Gita terminology, I'm the Dehi, I'm the possessor of the Deha, the body, and you're the Dehi, 
You're the possessor of the deha, the body. So let's just focus on the deha. Let's just focus on the body. We know what Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita that actually we're, we're spirit, soul, the dehi, the possessor of the body. But meanwhile, we've got these dehas. <laughs> we've got these bodies. <laughs> let's see what they can get into. <laughs> let's see what they can generate. <laughs> it reminds me of the wife of Oh my God, brothers, God, sister, Jagaturini Mataji, she sometimes gives lectures in, at the Govardhan retreat and they have in, in Braj. And I'll just quote her. Because when she said this, I sent her a message saying, wow, you're, you're preaching like a heavy swami. <laughs> <laughs> she starts talking about two, you know, capsules. Everyone knows what capsules are, you know, with herbal capsules or pharmaceutical capsules. She said, it's all about two capsules rubbing together. <laughs> but the, the capsules may rub together, but the contents don't touch each other. <laughs> I didn't say it. <laughs> I put the blame on it. <laughs> but it's actually a very appropriate example. No matter how hard the two capsules rub together, their contents never touch. In other words, the material activities of the living entity have nothing to do with the spirit soul. The spirit soul is aloof, untouched. Asango hyam purusha, the Shastra says. There's actually never a connection between the material body and the spirit soul. There's an imaginary connection. So who knows what accomplishes the imaginary connection between the spirit soul and the body? False ego. The false ego. Yes, it's the imaginary junction between matter and spirit. So that is the problem with material designations. When you identify with your material designations, then you use your senses in that way. You designate yourself. I am German, I am French. My senses should serve France or Germany. <laughs> That's a, it flows naturally like that. I am a man, I am a woman, or I am gender flexible. I should act with my senses in that way. So you brand yourself with a designation and then you follow through. Whereas bhakti means sarvopati vanir muktam tattra krena nirmala. Cleanse yourself of these material designations and engage your senses in the transcendental loving service of Krishna, the master of the senses. And gradually, by you doing that, your spiritual senses emerge. Because, as we emphasized the other day, that your spirit soul <clears throat> means you have spiritual senses. We forget that part. We think, okay, I'm spirit soul, but... When it comes to senses, you know, that's my material body, you know. <laughs> what does a spirit soul do? You wonder, does it float through the air like a ghost? Or... But I know what the body does. <laughs> we can all depend on that. The bedrock facts. But no, the spirit soul has spiritual senses. And bhakti is for the spiritual senses, just like material life is for the perverted covering, the material covering, the material senses. <coughs> so then we get to the point that the Supreme Personality God is the only shelter of everyone. And anyone who wants some other kind of shelter, some other kind of protection, is like a fool who desires to cross the ocean by holding the tail of a dog. None of you would ever make that mistake. You wouldn't go out to the water here and look for a dog on the shore and <laughs> okay and you position you push the dog into the water and and the dog starts to swim and you're holding on to the tail let's go let's go <laughs> let's cross over to normandy or something <laughs> you wouldn't do that <laughs> but this is what it means to take shelter to take material shelter so another point we were discussing the other day is the struggle <clears throat> for existence. 
Included in the struggle for existence is the search for friends. Because you feel alone, you feel incomplete. So whether you're male, female, in between, what, what have you, whether you're young or old, you, you're always on this quest for a real friend. Mm -hmm. Someone who will stand by you. <laughs> and of course, you, you actually hope that there'll be some shelter in that person. Shelter amidst the storm of material existence. So can you see that? So much of your life is meant for, is dedicated to searching for that best friend. Whether romantic partner, mm, parent, child, national leader. Everyone's looking for someone who will give them protection and help advance your, your own interests. That's a friend. That's what friends are for. Persons who will help you in grabbing happiness and beating off distress. So can you see that in your life? Consciously or unconsciously, you've been looking for the best friend. You try hanging out with this group, right? You try hanging out with that group. You try this partner. You try that partner. Oh, I'll have a child. That child will be it for me. You're always looking for someone, some way, somehow, who's going to be the shelter. Who's going to accompany you as you battle material existence. Because no one wants to battle alone. That's a struggle. But rarely do we think of it in that way. No, I'm just, you know, it's natural. You look for friends. You look for lovers. You have children. You look for national leaders in the next election. Who's going to advance our interests? Who's going to give us what we want? But we don't think of this as a struggle, right? What's a struggle? What's the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of struggle? Work. <laughs> Employment. <laughs> you got to get the money. And you got to do what the boss says. Or school. You've got to follow the curriculum and take your exams. That's a struggle. But you don't think of your quest for shelter from friendship, romance, social protection. You don't think of that as a struggle for existence. But the Bhagavatam explains it to be so. So here the devatas are approaching the Supreme Personality of Godhead with prayers because they're in a panic. Vitrasara has appeared. And this mess has been caused by Indra. Indra's a very interesting personality. He's a devata. He's the Lord of Heaven. But he has his moments. Why does he have his moments? You know in Govardhan Lila. But he has other moments too. He gets so impressed by his own power and majesty that he, he can act in ways that you wonder, well, hey Indra, what's going on with you? Just like with, you read in the Krishna book about mm, Bomasura, also known as Narakasura. Indra was feeling so threatened by Narakasura that he went to Dwarka to personally request Krishna, please do something about Narakasura or Bomasura, please do something about him. He came to the Sudharma assembly hall where Krishna holds forth as the prince of the Yadu dynasty because the, officially the king of the Yadu dynasty is Ugrasena. So Krishna is a, a prince. So Indra comes in and bows down, touching his helmet at Krishna's feet, requesting Krishna, please, this Narakasura is getting too much. Only you can do something about it. So what does Krishna do? 
he calls for Garuda and with his very feisty wife, Satyabhama, they climb on Garuda and they go to battle with the forces of Narakasura. So why did he take Satyabhama to battle? And you read in the Krishna book, it was a ferocious battle. <laughs> Wave after wave of demons were attacking and Krishna is dealing with them all. Even Garuda is helping beat back the Asuras with his beak, pecking at them and knocking them off their horses and elephants with his wings. And there's Krishna with such a bomb. Why? Does a, does a warrior usually go to battle with the, with the wife by his side? But Krishna is doing that because he wanted such a Bama to have a thrill seeing the whole battle scene. <laughs> He's giving her entertainment, hair raising, <laughs> and entertainment. Such slaughter was going on. Anyway, you know how ultimately Narakasura's forces, including the Mura demon, mentioned in the verse in the in the purport here mahatpadam <laughs> punya yesho marare the lord who terminated the marari demon excuse me the mura demon therefore the lord has the name murari the enemy of the mura demon who was a five-headed demon who lived in water and then there were the sons of Mur, Mura. On and on this battle went. What Krishna apparently went through to finish off all the forces of Narakasura as well as Narakasura himself. Because Narakasura had entered the heavenly planets causing a disturbance. He stole the earrings of Indra's mother, Aditi. He stole the umbrella of Varuna, powerful devata and he also caused havoc at the playground the pleasure holiday spot of the devatas on the top of mandara mountain just like you might try to go to spain for to catch some sunshine and warm waters beach so the devatas have their heavenly holiday spots but narakasura co-opted all that <laughs> So this, these are some of the reasons why the Devatas were so upset and why Indra went personally to request Krishna. He went to Dwarka to request Krishna. Please do something about this. So after the battle is over, <clears throat> Krishna and Satyabhama, you see, Satyabhama, she's the feisty wife. She can, she can feel cross very easily for Krishna's pleasure. Whereas Rukmini, known as the senior wife, she's very placid, very calm, very mm, peaceful, agreeable. Whereas such Obama, she's <laughs> she's a bit like hot chutney, <laughs> too hot to handle, too sweet to resist. <laughs> For Krishna's pleasure, Krishna likes variety. He doesn't simply want submissive wives. He wants those who give him some pleasure by being a bit, uh, by chastising him, being a bit unsubmissive. No. I won't. No. <laughs> that gives pleasure for Krishna. Whereas Rukmini is always, yes, what would you like? Certainly. So Krishna has it all. That's why we're envious of him. <laughs> So Krishna and Rukmini, excuse me, Satyabhama, after the whole massive battle is over, they go to see Indra and they bring back the earrings, the celestial earrings of Indra's mother, Aditi. They bring back uh, Varuna's umbrella. They restore the pleasure holiday spot of the Devatas on, at the very top of Mandara Mountain. And of course, Indra receives it all very gratefully. 
and then Krishna and Satyabhama leave. But on the way of their leaving, Satyabhama reminds Krishna, remember the Parijata flower that you've got for Rukmini. Actually, Narada Muni gave my gave your co your co wife gave your wife Rukmini a Parijata flower, and you remember how I felt. Narada Muni took the Parijata flower from from Indra's realm, the heavenly planets, and brought it to Earth. Normally, that doesn't happen. In this way, by Rukmini getting one Parijata flower, which is so heavenly, the fragrance spreads heavenly aromas all around. By her getting the Parijata flower, I'm feeling a bit envious and jealous. What are you going to do about that, Krishna? <laughs> so what did Krishna promise her? Oh, you're getting upset because Rukmini as a porridge under flower, remind me when the time comes, I'll get you the whole tree. <laughs> so that's what happened as Krishna and Satyabhama were leaving the heavenly planets. Satyabhama reminded Krishna, what about that Parijata tree? I've got to compete with the other wives. <laughs> so yes, they grabbed a Parijata tree. And what happened next? Indra, who's supposed to be so grateful because of Krishna finishing off Narakasura and bringing back to the heavenly planets the earrings, the umbrella, and so forth. Indra puts up resistance. We don't get details of the, exactly how he put up resistance, but he was trying to restrain Krishna. Wait, wait, wait. You can't take a Parijata tree from the heavenly planets to earth. You can't do that. What happened? What's, this, what's wrong with this guy? <laughs> well, that's Indra. He got overwhelmed by his own wealth and power. So one minute he's offering gratitude to Krishna. Thank you for terminating Narakasura. Thank you for returning these celestial paraphernalia. And then just because Krishna grabbed one Parijata tree, Indra is, wants to stop him. So this shows you how wealth can intoxicate. Of course, you see a even more graphic example that in the case of Nalakuva and Manigriva in Damodar Lila. They were <clears throat> sons of Kuvera, very powerful demigod, but they have degraded so much due to attachment for opulence. They just abandon control of their senses completely. So you see the same tendency in Indra. He loses it sometimes because he's overwhelmed by his power and wealth. Who is this Krishna taking a Parijata tree? That's, that only belongs to us in the heavenly planets. He totally forgot how Krishna took his request to do something to solve the Narakasra situation. He totally forgot that. And he, in some way, tried to impede Krishna so, of course, he lost. And I like what Srila Prabhupada explains. He said, what was Indra thinking? Besides being his mind being overwhelmed by his own power and wealth, he was also thinking, this Krishna is henpecked. <laughs> Just because that feisty such a bomber wants to compete with the other wife, Rukmini, Krishna grabs a Parijata tree. He's henpecked. But well, Prabhupada explains that actually, this is Arupita. This is Indra imposing on others the qualities he himself has. He's attached to his wife Sachi, and so <laughs> he's thinking this is what this is the situation of Krishna. He's attached. He's henpecked by such a bama. Just in other words. I know I'm henpecked, I'm, I'm, I'm attached, so, you know, uh, happy wife means happy life. <laughs> that must be the case with Krishna. <laughs> so this is life in the heavenly planets. It's not free from intrigue, it's not free from problems. Of course, what do we say about that? 
yeah, it's not free of problems. And Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Abrahma Bhuvana Loka Punarvatina Arjuna, from the highest planet in the universe down to the lowest, all are places of misery. Yeah, but <laughs> we've heard that the sense gratificatory experience in the heavenly planets is thousands of times more intense than on earth. Never mind that the demons sometimes cause havoc in the heavenly planets. Never mind that the lifespan of the devatas will come to an end. Never mind all that. Just give me those magic moments. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Kali Yuga vision. So when we hear about Brajlila, then we hear about the full perfection of the Supreme Personality God who agrees to even he, he'll come under the control of his devotee's love and he, he gets perplexed he gets wonderstruck ah oh, what kind of love is this there used to be so many pop songs before everyone got so cynical these days what kind of love is this <laughs> I never experienced this before. <laughs> you see the perfection of all that in Krishna's personal pleasure pastimes. All right, any questions? We talked about a lot today. Tour of the heavenly planets, Indra, Satyabhama, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Yes. Krishna Guru, uh, Guru Dev. What can we do if we think that we're the controller? If we think we're the controller? Engage in serving the devotees. And engage in helping to bring about other persons becoming devotees. Serve Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in Dasaras. As a servant of Lord Chaitanya, a dedicated servant, through the service to Mahaprabhu's lotus feet, all the other glories of relationships with Krishna open up to you. Otherwise, it's very difficult to establish a relationship with Krishna in this age of Kali. But if you go through Lord Chaitanya, that's the secret of success. <clears throat> yes. That's Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita lays the foundations. As Krishna says in the Gita, he, the one who actually understands my power and glory, will engage in devotional service. Bhagavad Gita is the beginning. And then Bhagavatam will, by the time of the 10th canto, introduce you to Krishna Lila and the love of the residents of Vrindavan. And then Chaitanya Charitamrita will introduce you to Radha Tattva. Because that's what Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came to understand. So would you say, in order to maintain that level of respect, that foundation, we should all do Bhagavad Gita regardless of what level one is? In Bhagavatam and Chaitanya Charitamrita, Prabhupada has so wondrously given us so many Bhagavad Gita verses in the purport. Yes, we always read Bhagavad Gita and our appreciation of where Bhagavad Gita is heading deepens and deepens with each reading. So what you perceive in Bhagavad Gita as a brand new devotee is not the same as what you'll perceive in Bhagavad Gita as a more advanced devotee. Krishna says in the Gita twice, Mamana Baba Man Bhakto, always think of me. So what is it about this Krishna that we should always think of? Bhagavatam brings you closer to that and Chaitanya Charitamrita reveals the most intimate secrets. 
And the leader in thinking about Krishna is Srimati Radharani. Yes. Hi, Um So, when it comes to tough lessons in bhakti, um, I generally I recognize that there's two there's two ways it usually goes. So firstly, there's that initial reaction of "Oh, like you, you got punched in the stomach" kind of thing. Can you give me an example of a tough lesson in bhakti? Well, that everyone else had pizza prasad. There was none left for you. <laughs> Okay, give me an example, please. Well, uh, well I'm thinking of, about the lesson you gave the other day on Prahlad Maharaj and, and what he said to his friend. That's a so, tough lesson? <laughs> it's um, humiliating. Well, let's go with that. Like, um, let's go with what? His example. Okay. Um, so. It's not going to be too much for you to think about it? No, no. Okay, I want to make it easy on you. Then. <laughs> <laughs> so then, then afterwards, then, then you get some kind of uh, realization or, or something like that, then we just think, oh, you know, that that experience was worth it, that, that makes it okay, sort of thing. But nevertheless, when, when that tough lesson comes again in a different way, then that initial bitterness or that initial, like, uh, feeling of dejectedness is, is still there and the quality doesn't seem to change. What can we do to find new freshness? In what? In, in, well, in, in the tough lessons that come, so we don't feel like we're getting worn out every single... Um, well, give me a, I'm missing what, what precisely you're talking about. You gotta <clears throat> explain, what, what's the situation? <laughs> mm. All right, it's use eating out. ice cream as an example. Yeah. Can you do that? Will that help? Uh. What situations are you talking about? Sorry, no, I just, I just drawn a blank. Uh, okay, like, it's hard for me to answer. It's a tough lesson. You mean to understand what Prahlad is saying? That tough? Or the, what he says is tough. It's tough. Sounds like tough love. He's ruining all the fun by his saying, uh, Sarvatra Labyate Daivad. You get that same flavor in any species of life. That's, that's a tough pill to swallow. I think you mean that there's lessons sometimes that are tough to swallow, and then later on you understand that actually no, it's, it's a good lesson. Like what though? I need an example. The Prahlad example is that our enjoyment as an animal would be just the same flavor as of a human. There's no point chasing these yes. material pleasures. Yeah. So that's called a. So what's the tough lesson? So I think he's asking that even though you realize that that is true and a good lesson to take on board, you still feel the pain when you receive the lesson again in the future? But why you receive the lesson again? No, not like, it, it could be like a, a different lesson, but like still tough sort of thing. But, but, but it's like, a, it wears us out instead of makes us more like... What wears like, you out? Kaganapu, can you help? <laughs> can anyone help? I'm lost here. <laughs> Please, anyone. Like. Maybe he's saying, like, wh wh why do we have to be continually humiliated or humbled? Like, we get humbled once, but why do we have to get humbled again? <laughs> oh, what Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, mudha janmani janmani. Birth after birth, you'll be a fool. Not just one lifetime, but birth after birth. Because Maya is falsely attractive, and our attraction to Krishna hasn't developed enough to overpower our attraction to Maya. That's why it's called Maya. It looks so good, doesn't it? There'll be fulfillment, there'll be satisfaction, or at least there'll be something to do on a cold winter night. <laughs> <laughs> You look out the window, you see ice on the roads. And like a couple of days ago, you know, the wind is howling. <laughs> so the human being naturally thinks, well, can't go outside. Let's have some warm coziness inside. Am I explaining what's on your mind? Yeah, no. <laughs> With knowledge, 
you control your mind and senses. Otherwise, there can be no advancement in your life. Yes, it's true. The material energy looks so good. That's why it's called Maya. False promises. Through knowledge and chanting Hare Krishna attentively, you can battle back. This human form of life you have is a crossroads. It's a junction. You can go up or you can go down. You can't do that in any other species of life. Other bodies, you're carried along by the, the laws of nature. But human form of life, you've got your options. You're going to go up, you're going to go down. So if you saturate your life with opportunities for the higher taste, there'll be no opportunity for the lower taste. And even if sometimes you're harassed by past experiences of the lower taste, you then compare in your mind. Hmm, in bhakti there's this, in material life there's that. Nah, I can't go that material route. It's chewing that which has already been chewed. And then you start to wonder, you're wonderstruck. How is it that the same old same thing looks so attractive to me when I've been through all that, done, done that, been there? This is the glory of Maya. So the more you take to chanting Hare Krishna with determination, the more your life will be a success. I, I was just wondering the past few days, I was reading one purport where Prabhupada said, and he says it several times in purports, that in this age of color, you can very easily cross over the ocean of material existence by chanting Hare Krishna. So I'm thinking very easily cross over the ocean of material existence just by chanting Hare Krishna. Well, I should do that. <laughs> I should easily cross over. But you're saying, but what about those allurements? What about those illusions, right? But you can, by taking shelter of the Hare Krishna mantra, you can defeat those illusions. But yes, you really have to be a dedicated chanter. That's why I like it when I come here and I see the devotees chanting Hare Krishna with deep sincerity. I know they can conquer that way. If they just keep doing that, they'll conquer. <laughs> Anything else? Let's see. Vaishnavis, any questions? Yes. Go on, Goranga Gopal. Um, how can you, um, how can we conciliate uh, being ambitious to receive the mercy and uh, waiting for it to come? Give me an example of being ambitious. Well, sometimes um, we may make some plans to uh, um, you know, serve someone or um, so that in that way we get more mercy or something, but it may go against. Give me an example. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, well, practically, um, you know, the mind, my mind may make, may make plan to uh, um, just, you know, serve you or anything like that, serve the spiritual master. But at the same time, he knows that, well, it's not the appropriate thing to do necessarily because uh, other devotees may be doing it already. So uh, I just wonder if, how do you conciliate, you know, this desire to do it, and in the same time, um, just knowing that waiting for it and praying for it is. Well, you may be eager to render some personal assistance, but uh, I don't have that many needs, you know. I have, <laughs> <laughs> but when I think about how a devotee like you, and there are others, a devotee like you is sacrificing on Sankirtan, helping other devotees, cultivating other devotees. That's so enlivening. I remember one situation, there was one devotee very attached to Prabhupada's physical service. And he, and he just couldn't give that up. 
whereas Prabhupada was seeing that this devotee had potential for going out into the field and into the preaching field and doing wonderful service for spreading Lord Chaitanya's mission. So <laughs> I know this for a fact because the devotee told me. So the devotee, so what Prabhupada did was very ingenious. Prabhupada knew that there's, he had another senior leader who was, who, who couldn't stand this other devotee. <laughs> so Prabhupada said in private to that other leader who couldn't stand that devotee, you know, so-and-so is really off. You know, he's, you know, he's just, he's just not all there in, in Krishna consciousness. And of course that devotee, ah I always do it. <laughs> and he, and he went and told the other devotee, you know what Prabhupada just said about you. <laughs> So anyway, so the devotee <laughs> who was so attached to Prabhupada's physical service, he, he just, oh, Prabhupada doesn't want me around anymore. Oh, he's, he's said such things about me to my enemy. <laughs> so he left and he left Prabhupada's physical service and went out to preach. And before Prabhupada's disappearance, Prabhupada explained to him, you thought I was kicking you out. I just couldn't stand seeing you with your potential just doing menial tasks for me. So I had to get you out there so you would accomplish great things. So then the devotee understood. He was crying. Oh, thank you, Prabhupada. <laughs> get the point. <laughs> Anything else? Yes, whoever... Say something. <laughs> I'm just wondering how do you overcome, like, from a reading or doing devotional service, how do we overcome familiarity so we don't get too familiar? With what? You could just be um, you know, taking care of Gordon and Ty, and then you think, um, then it, many times we become overly confident that you, you while you're. Whatever service you're doing, when you get that feeling, oh, I've done this so many times, it's the same old, same old, that's the time to beg for mercy. This is misperception. This is my mind concocting. And you have to beg that you rise above it. It's, the, it's humiliating and it's time for begging. When you start feeling it's the same old, same thing, this is misperception. But if you take it seriously, yeah, it's the same old, same thing. Then you provided a fast motorway into your life by the material energy, by Maya. Yeah, it's the same old, same thing. Come on, Tyler. How long are you going to do this? Get real. I mean, what about your senses? What about your body? <laughs> what about your potential? <laughs> so it all starts with familiarity with bhakti activities. You start getting dissatisfied with your service and then you start getting dissatisfied with the association of devotees. Oh, the Prabhus and the Asha. Oh, I see the same ones every day. They don't appreciate me. They don't know my real glories. They just get in my way. They bug me sometimes. So everything starts to degenerate. I've even heard devotees say, who start to become affected in that way. Oh, devotees just talk about the same things. <laughs> As if material life has so many different subject matters. <clears throat> what does Bhagavatam say? Shrota Vyadini Rajendra Nirnam Santi Sahasrasa. Yes, there's so many topics for material life to talk about. Apashyatam atmatattvam, while you're being blind to your own self-realization. Griheshu griham edinam, those who are attached to their material life and can't control their mind and senses have many things to talk about, but it's actually all comes down to the same thing. That 
was my, well, that's another thing. But I've heard devotees say that oh, devotees just talk about the same things. It's sad when that kind of consciousness starts to creep in. Because talking about Krishna and Lord Chaitanya is unlimited. But material affairs look so, when you're in Maya, they look inviting. Oh, there's, there's this subject, there's that topic. But if you're skillful, you'll see that all the material topics lead to the same goal. Eating, sleeping, sex, and fearing. After all is said and done, that's the bottom line. And for the devotee, after all is said and done, the bottom line is Krishna's service. <laughs> yes? Hi Krishna Gurudev, um, you spoke about revenge in material life. I'm just wondering, does revenge play a part in the spiritual world? For Krishna's pleasure. Yeah. Such Obama wanted a bit of revenge against Rukmini. She wanted to... She felt minimized. She got a porridge out the flower. What about me? <laughs> That's all purely for Krishna's pleasure. It's Leela, pastimes. Yes? Hi, Krishna Maharaj. In our practice, how can we um, kind of defer against um, maybe slipping into this mood of the demigods where we recognize Krishna as the Supreme Personality of Godhead and of a person, but at the same time we're attached to material enjoyment. Follow Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. That's your easy portal, your easy gateway out of material illusion. <clears throat> Just focus on Lord Chaitanya and serving his mission. Everything will come to you that way. Yes, <laughs> I know you've been waiting. What do you mean by making peace for where you are? Like, I was just trying to think of an example. Like, uh, for example, my senses have been really hankering for like an outfit to have on my. But at the same time, uh, <laughs> I know that uh, I should, like, this, the, the, the goal is to be satisfied with whatever Krishna gives you. So I've been like, like, crunching them. So you saw a nice sari online. <laughs> <laughs> is that it? <laughs> <laughs> just analyze how is that really going to improve your spiritual life think in that way is it what's the feeling you're, what's the rasa you're going to taste by this material acquisition what is it you're more you you mean you're more the body <laughs> You feel like, you, what is yourself? <laughs> you have to think in that way. Use your intelligence. They didn't teach you this at the university, did they? <laughs> they taught you how to be a consumer. So you have to use your spiritual intelligence. Develop it so that you'll think, well, if I, what, what's the need for this acquisition? I don't have enough clothes. I'm wearing rags? <laughs> or am I trying to attract someone? <laughs> oh no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think your bhakti qualities are sufficient. What do you say about that? Okay. <laughs> Anything else? Yes. Last question. You mentioned last week that uh, the devotee uh, or the aspiring devotee should know where he's at in order to enrich accordingly. In order to what? And, and read uh, the, the scriptures according to where we are at. If we have the we should Yes, I meant you don't read like Chaitanya Charitamrita's Gopi Leela and Radha Tup and think, oh yeah, that's, 
I'm right there with it. That's where I'm right there with it. <laughs> so I was wondering, uh, as a neophyte, why are, are we advised to also read Chaitanya Charitamrita and Hindu tenth canto of Bhagavatam? But as I explained carefully, Prabhupada explained that everything is there in his books for all types of devotees. So you have to you have to know the medicine for you that you're meant to focus on at a particular stage. But it's there in the books. So just like someone maybe someone yes, someone asked me about their reading Bilapakusha Manjali. I said, Yes, you can be aware of such topics, but don't think you're there. Yeah. <laughs> There's a big difference between being aware of such things. Oh, that's the goal. Oh, mm. okay, one day. Let me purify myself. Let me serve Mahaprabhu. And now all that can open up to me when the Lord wants. So you may be, you may inform yourself of such topics, but you don't jump to the top level of the tree. As Prabhupada said, don't jump like monkeys. <laughs> you have to keep in mind where you're at. Sometimes, I remember once a devotee was kind of arguing with Prabhupada. Why? But these topics are the highest. And Prabhupada said, yes, but you are the lowest. <laughs> Don't jump like a monkey to the top level of the tree. So you can be aware of such topics, but you shouldn't think, yeah, that's where I'm at. Just like a child studying or 1 plus 1 equals 2 and 2 plus 2 equals 4, the child may be aware that there's such a thing as advanced mathematics, but the child knows he or she's not there yet at that level. But the child may be aware. Okay? Mainly you've got a lot on your plate reading three times Bhagavatam, three times Shaitanya Sharitamrita, endlessly reading Bhagavatam, um, Bhagavad Gita, Nectar of Devotion, Krishna book, you got a lot on your plate. <laughs> but it's good to be aware of what's the full potential in bhakti, what's on the horizon. But as I was explaining the other day, even a neophyte in a very covered way is tasting the ultimate rasa but in a very covered way. All right. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna.